Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Grittiest Take as I am joined again by the fantastic Flyers Nitty Gritty reporter Sam Wismer as we're here to talk about, just like we did with the Phantoms, I'll be linking that video at the end, their season recap and player analysis. We're going to do the same with the Flyers and talk about certain players and analyze their play and then talk about the season as a whole, which wasn't really roller coaster for the Flyers like it was for the Phantoms where there was actually good and bad. There was a lot more bad and ugly rather than the good to go with the bad and the ugly as the saying would go sam when it came to the philadelphia flyer yeah definitely uh it just it it wasn't our best season (laughs) no that's that's us being uh kind but we'll start with um we did bring in a guy that did have a good season for us in before his injury which he will have him back by camp but Uh, Cam Atkinson did come in and have a very good first year for the Flyers, 50 points in 73 games, provided a veteran leadership, already a assistant captain type player, and I think Don the A in games too as well this year already. So 23 goals, 27 assists. He also probably would have gotten much closer to the uh, 30 goal total if he played all the games instead of 73. So he did have that point in the middle of the season because he got off to a hot start then kind of teetered a bit and then got going again. But also, he's a 32-year-old player, that so you don't expect him to be Mr. Consistency necessarily at that point. But overall, I do think as a guy that we picked up, he actually did end up working out. Yeah, no, he definitely did. It was was a a good trade for um, Mr. Jake Voracek. Um, It kind of worked out both ways, too, because Jake worked with setting up some of the young kids on Columbus so they could score, and he was just a passer facilitator guy. And he worked out better here because we needed a guy that just wants to shoot the door and puck more. And Cam Atkinson loves doing that more than Jay Voracek. Yeah, and I've, I, I'm I'm a huge fan of Cam. I have a jersey. Um, so, you know, he even said, you know, the season didn't go as planned, but, you know, we're coming back and we're, we're planning to do better next year. And, you know, talk is cheap. We need to see action. <laughs> Yeah, and we saw action. That's the thing. He was one of those guys, even in games that overall I didn't like the overall effort. Cam, when healthy, was one of those guys that was always bringing it. And I admire that. And I also admire, like I said in the past podcast, about uh, uh, giving a compliment to Lappy and Kirk McDonald's bluntness and Cam being that blunt about how bad the season was, not just to, at the end season interviews, but during the course of the season as well and on how he feels the team needs to step up more and things they need to focus on is a player you want to have in your locker room because then you go, oh, well, yeah, I do really need to step it up. So, like, I do think that works, especially with guys that at times this year seem to kind of be in cruise control where Konechny, I think, was a solid passer the entire year but did not obviously shoot the darn puck enough. And then at the end of the season because he – was quoted, I believe it was about a month ago at this point, but he said, like, he himself even admitted to knowing he had to be more aggressive on the shot. And he started doing that to round out the season and playing a little bit more like the normal TK. But also, most of his 36 assists were primary assists. So it's not like that's anything to scoff at either. It's just he didn't play the game we more need him to play which is have the more Cam Atkinson shoot first mentality and let all these other playmakers on the team be the playmakers. That That's the only problem I have with TK season. Overall, I think people were kind of harsh on him because it's 52 points in 77 games. Realistically, for a team that performed as bad as the Flyers and don't, is not that, it's actually a pretty solid overall season when he didn't shoot the puck enough. Nobody considered TK a great passer, and he kind of showed this year that he can be a very good passer. Yeah, TK definitely showed he could be a playmaker this year. Um, you know, I, I think he did get, you know, a little bit of grief from from the fan base and, and media alike. But, you know, um, you can't expect the guy to be the same throughout his years. You you can't, you know. I mean, yeah, back, back in the day you had your enforcers like Riley Cote and you had Frank Bialowis and – Donald Brashears of the world, like all those guys. Yeah, you you had all these guys that that were the same throughout their career, but that's not how hockey is nowadays. You don't, you can't expect a player to be consistent throughout his years. Players are going to have their down years, and I think we've seen since the bubble that 
TK isn't the same TK that he always was. Yeah, because he had three straight 24-goal seasons in the early years of his career. That's nothing to scoff at. And even in those seasons, he was still a pretty good passer because he kept elevating each year, 23, then 25, then 37 for his best career year of 61 points. The other thing is, this year is his second best, actually, career year points-wise. But he just didn't score. It's just we, we didn't see him play the normal style of brand you see TK play, which is more shoot and play make second, which is what Cam Atkinson kind of is. That's why I always say Atkinson's kind of the older version of TK, because if TK's playing the style of the 24 goal seasons, he has a shoot first, but still is a good playmaker when he does decide to do that guy where last year, he really got away from just, just in a skid where this year, I think he just, trying to work his way back and get his confidence back, got very playmake happy, where then at the end of the season, he started realizing, well, I do have one of the best shots on the team. I should probably utilize that more. And then that's why he started having more good chances and scoring again at the end of the season with some of the good shots, you know, from TK of picking the near side or picking the far side, depending what way the goalie cheats. And he's always been good at picking this spot. Like, he was one of those guys, we talked about certain Phantoms players like Sandine and Ratcliffe being impressed with their closeout to the season. TK was definitely one of the guys for the Flyers. I personally was at least impressed with how he closed out the season. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I always like TK. I'm a huge TK fan, TK advocate. I, I've i always loved Travis Konechny. Um you know, and players have down years, and I, I think that we've we've seen, even though points wise, yeah, he's probably had one of his better better years. But you know, um, a friend of mine has always said, if you're not a goal scorer in Philadelphia, you're looked at as a POS. So, yeah, which is not always a fairest assessment because you also can still be very good. That's why Voracek was overhated a lot by people when he was still one of the best assist guys if you actually looked at assist numbers it's just they wanted somebody that score was like the score a check year all the time yeah well Voracek also likes to block people on twitter for no reason well yeah but that's also just his hockey personality so, uh, but to, um take it, take it from someone who's blocked for no reason <laughs> yeah but the um when it comes to overall play of certain guys. I guess that can put, slide us right into this topic. For the Flyers who were at least, uh, we mentioned it in the Phantoms podcast, at least calling a spade a spade in a retool, if not in a rebuild. What guys on the team, now no, Now we both stress this, usually both of us is the type of people that cover the team and like cover, unless there's a guy that really had down here, it's not like we want to trade anybody, but it's more who works the best in the structure of who's probably going to get you the most so you can retool the quickest. And also who is maybe at the age for, if you're a retooling team, by the time you're good, they're going to be 32. So like what, like th those are all kind of the factors you have in to this. But like, if you looked at our roster minus James Van Reems, like who's Mr. Captain obvious when it comes to trying to trade it. Uh, somebody like him to get rid of the cap hit. Um, who else uh, on the roster, even if you don't want to trade them, but that you think would be guys that the Flyers might consider trading because they have value and would help expedite the retool process? Provy. Provy, yeah. Provy was, was one that I was definitely uh, thinking of because he still has that good value. And um, I think a, a team will still put, pay if you want – more defense back you can get a defenseman yeah. and a forward you know, for him or get more picks depending which direction you want to go there but you can definitely get good assets and if we're, if we're really looking at it the the reality of him being traded possibility um but you got to look at his contract and what team's going to want to eat that contract besides the arizona coyotes which i mean him and ghost would play together so uh have fun with ghost but uh are you talking about jvr now or no Provy. I still think Proby's contract's not that big because this is his only bad year. So if you're yeah. going off of his entire I, I mean, but, career. But who, who's going to want to eat that contract right now? JVR, different story. JVR, somebody's going to eat that contract to get JVR. Well, yeah, but JVR's on the final year. But Proby 6.75 for defensemen, I don't necessarily agree as much there. I feel like that's a cheap, cheap defense contract when you send to have guys that get paid eight. 
and up, or for example, you have Rasmus or Shalinen who gets paid five point whatever, um, and is really more of a three point nine million dollar ish like level defenseman. I do think Provi at his best is definitely worth around six seven. It's just this year he was bad until the final month of the season. The only like, and with Ryan Ellis in four games, the yeah, only time. And I don't think Provi's had a solid defense partner. And no, Niskanen was his best season when he was there. Yeah, and Ryan Ryan Ellis was supposed to be his partner this year, and then unfortunately Ryan has been hurt all year with a pelvic injury. Yeah, Provi also has had very good playoff runs, though. Like in 1920, he was good for us. Even in the 17-18 playoffs, he wasn't good defensively, but he was solid offensively in his early years. So I think... He's a defenseman. Like, if we don't trade him, I'm not going to be mad. I'm not happy with what he said uh, to the media because I thought that it comes off as immature and you have to be a more professional. But uh, at the same time, the media also was definitely some of the most cutthroat when it came to any player to Yvonne Provorov. So you kind of have to expect to sometimes get what you're giving at times too. But at the same time, from the player side, you should try to be more professional. But I also get why he could have freaked out uh, in, in a from a personal, like, person perspective. I mean, he pulled a, uh, he pulled a Jake Voracek. Oh, Do yeah, remember, Frankie. Although, I, although remember that. Remember what, what Jake said to, to Mike Mastolowski? Oh, 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 that, oh, yeah, yeah, with uh, Mike Silski, yeah. Great, yeah. Silski does sometimes ask very pointed um, I don't really know a nice way to say this, so I'm just going to go with very pointed questions. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, Jordan Hall was the one asking Provy the question, and Jordan Hall is a very good reporter. So yeah, he's an honest guy, and he doesn't, and he usually asks questions like he did with that one. That wasn't a pointed question; that was a very open-ended question that Provy just decided to kind of go with the hardest answer on. Yeah. So. We shall see what the the summer brings with trades and everything, yeah. but I definitely think JVR is a goner. Yeah, JVR is going. I think you picked a guy that has a chance of Pro V. Obviously, Ryan Ellis is staying because he's going to come back healthy, which is a godsend. But nobody, if you try to trade him, nobody's going to take him with the uncertainty of his health coming into next season. Uh, Rasmus Ristolainen just got re-signed, so obviously you're not trading him. Um, the if, I swear to God, if this is the season, I will literally be the most pissed off person if after this year we trade Travis Anhorn. Like, this Anhorn has had the best yeah, career. Yeah, like, this yeah year. like, but that seems like something that the Flyers would be like, oh, we're going to bank off of his best season. And you're just like, no, didn't you just see, I don't know, a team in your division that nobody thought greatly things of Adam Pellick until two years ago? And now Adam Pellick's one of the most consistent defensemen in the league. But, like, sometimes guys just take a little bit longer to to develop. So I I would kind of put him and my good buddy Zach that wrote for us for a bit and did stuff, talked about – I talked that talk with him, too, when we said Sanheim could be exactly in the pool with Pellick category where they just didn't develop until their mid-20s. Well, you know, I'm not the Morgan Frost fan club. I'm not a huge fan of Morgan Frost, even though I've seen him for like 3,000 years on the fans now. (laughs) Um, You see him starting to get a little bit better, but I think he needs an identity and he doesn't know where he's going yet. He doesn't know if he's going to be right wing, left wing or center. I agree with that. Yeah, that's on the organization, I I think, in my opinion. Like, I think especially because I kind of said it on the fan podcast, it looks like by default with Tanner and everybody in, he's going to be playing wing in the future anyway. So why the heck? Did you not let Noah Cage, who's a better, just by game center anyway, because the game Noah Cage plays profiles the NHL center. Frost doesn't. And you should just let Frost play the wing because he's more of an offensive threat than he ever is going to be a defensive threat. Cage is very good on both sides. And Tanner's very good on both sides. So, like, both of those guys profile more center. That's the, so I completely agree at that point. That's why I also... I'm still a little bit more higher than most people in Frost because I don't think he's ever had an identity. And it's, I think, one of the hardest things to be successful in, like, you were getting at is if you don't know what the hell you're actually supposed to be to doing in the first place fully. So, and you're trying to turn this guy into, like, that's why it took Sandheim so long to be successful. They tried to pigeonhole him into being 
something he wasn't for so long that once they started just letting him be him and be free on the offensive end, it even helped his defensive end because that's what he truly was coming up through juniors and through the minors. And then they try to turn him into something he wasn't. Well, with Frost, I don't know why they were trying to turn him into the second coming of like, I don't even know, like a great, like, like one of these fast speedster two way centers, because most speedster guys are more offensive when you, think about it but like I don't know why they're trying to turn him into like I guess an Anthony Sorelli because Frost is never going to be Anthony Sorelli if Frost is a more offensive zone guy Anthony Sorelli was always more of a guy that people knew had an, a higher offensive ceiling but was defense first so like that's the problem that's the problem I've always had with the Flyers with some development guys uh I gave them compliments on certain guys in the last one, but he's definitely one that I think they kind of led astray for a minute. And Sanheim, I think, took this long to develop, not just because of his own doing, but because of not having the best coaching of where to actually focus on each thing to build your career up. And eventually, I think he kind of just pulled for what my baseball fans would know, what Zach Eflin basically said to our analytical staff and was like, screw you all, I'm just doing my thing. Like, so, and then that's kind of what just made him his... uh, best version of of himself so i think those are guys i definitely like i would definitely not trade saying up frost is a 50 50 if we trade him and get somebody good that i think it, like if we moved him for an ellie tolvin and two guys that can kind of one organization's guy that hasn't got going fully for another organization guy like i'm fine with that but if we kept them around i'm also fine with that because i think they did start building chemistry with Tippett and uh Kate, so if you can have one of those two pairings together, it is good to have a bunch of young guys have chemistry. And Tippett, Frost, and Kate did have chemistry. Brink and Fairby started building chemistry. So, I mean, I'll let you touch on that point, but I think that's one of the things in the positive and an overall negative season that is good for next year for the Flyers. All these young guys seem to start to kind of find each other's games out and have some chemistry with each other. Um, I know from the last podcast that I was on today, I feel like I've been on 10,000. Um, they said that Ronnie Attard or Attard, oh God, we need to figure out the right pronouncing for that. Yeah. Before, um, is actually going to be training with Team USA all summer. Yeah, so that's going to be killer experience for somebody like him to be able to uh, train with with the best of the best. And uh, it would have been interesting without injury to see if Cam York would have been in that same boat. Yeah, I mean, Cam, though, I'm, I've am i always been very high on Cam. I think Cam is, is ready. I don't think he needs any more AHL all the time. I think he's... Oh, no, I'm just talking about a training with USA. Because yeah. He's, yeah, that's all I was talking about. He's a flyer. He's going to be a flyer. Um, you know, and I think him going home for a month and then coming back and being here all summer and training will do wonders for him. Oh, yeah, I think so, too. Just like I think what you brought up with that, it'll do wonders for... um him so i think both of those guys are going to move in the right direction and adder ended up becoming a steal i think in the end with the 72nd pick at 19 where flair since coming in has got some good mid-round talent we talked about day noyer a little bit in the podcast before with the phantoms wisdom obviously is a mid-round talent noah cates is a mid-round talent oh well he's a third round i think but that's but, but still out of the first two rounds so you have to actually really pick them to get to get good guys there because the first two rounds you kind of it's more expected percentage wise if you look at history after that the percentages dip drastically in each uh corresponding round so i'm definitely happy with what's happened with those guys but uh before i shoot it back to you i would say with trades another guy i could see us moving just because he fits it to cam i honestly see us going 70 30 with the favor of i think we're going to keep him because he's such a great leader to have in the locker room but i could see because he is 32 going on 33 and has a pretty good contract for a contending team i could also see if you get blown away and somebody offers you a really good prospect you want or something because they're contending and need a cam agus and the flyers are probably not going to say no to that so that's why i would give it 30 percent uh to go with trade but i would say 70 that they're probably going to keep lauding somebody though i could see just because his career, we've known before from rumors, at least, that it, that there's been interest. And in the past, the Flyers didn't want to move him. But now they're in a completely different position as a team. And he's going 27 on 28. So if you think it's going to take you a couple of years, he's going to be one of those guys that are kind of hinted at that will be in their 30s by the time the team might be good again. And it's not like Lawton's the fleetest of foot skater. So 
he we don't know how he will age into his 30s. Uh, he would be an interesting guy that I don't mind if we keep him because he has a great contract. He's only paid three million bucks in 2026. But for that same reason, that's also why I think his trade value is really good because he has one of the better contracts. That's also a very good defensive forward that that can provide at least like 30 to maybe even 40 something points in the offensive zone. So I would say Lawton's a guy I could see us moving just because his value is probably very good because of his play, but also because of his good contract. And that kind of, to me, just barks a retool trade because you're going to get good assets for Lawton and bring in younger guys, some younger guys that might even fit a similar player profile to Scott Lawton. And then you kind of give to a team that's more contending a Scott Lawton. And it's not that I want to trade Scott Lawton, but I could see that happening. And I would be and I would be happy for him, too, if he did get to go to a contender and actually be in a more front front end spot here and not have to wait a couple years for us to be there. Yeah, I mean, realistically, though, anybody could be traded. Oh, they could. I'm just looking at percent because I know we're not going to trade Tippett because there's no way you've got Tippett for Claude Giroux and then you're immediately moving on from him because I swear to God, if they do that, I'm going to be heated. Um, but, like, like he he getting moved in the offseason would be how mad I'd be with saying I'm weak, but it would be for different perspectives because you just traded your franchise legend of the current era for Tippett just to move him, um, where that would be annoying. And then trading Sandheim after he's been the best defenseman on the team. Uh, no, yeah, no, that's not going to work. If you're a plus 10 or a team that's what, like a minus 30 something as a team, like that, you know, you're doing something right there. Um, so, like, yeah, I agree with you, though. Anybody really could be, but I think there's certain guys personally, if you start doing too much, you're just going to kind of ruin the entire momentum you have with some guys around at the season. Like I know the jokes that people made. And I said this in my other video about like, Oh, we're going to have 10 different people on the roster. Well, if you have 10 different people on the roster, you better be one of the best roster flippers in the league. And Chuck Fletcher ain't one of the best roster flippers in the league. So like, unless if you have Danny B doing it, maybe, but like, I, I don't think that's necessarily a realistic thing. I see us moving like three, four guys, maybe. To do to do a retool with the way Dave Scott's talking, about. I don't see us doing seven to ten. Like I think that's a really unrealistic um, expectation to see seven to ten trades. Yeah, I mean, I, we got to see. I'm I, I'm not one to sit here and be a couch GM and be like, oh, we're trading this guy, we're trading this guy, we're gonna have this many trades. Like I'm a more I'm more of a person who's let's see it play out and then. But, you know, like, like I said before, JVR definitely a goner. Provy, goner, Frost, 50-50. Yeah, Provy, I'm not sure. I would say Provy's probably 70-30 in the way of, I think, if they get a good trade, they're going to move him. Where, because he seems to be kind of falling out here. Where, but like, also, I don't think they're going to move him if, like, I was talking about, like, like, if the Blues calling, like, well, we'll give you Scott Puronovich, and nothing against Scott Puronovich, he's a hell of a defensive, but he's not good, he's not to the level of what if Von Provorov has one of his really good seasons again, Provy, because he's more of an offensive driven guy that's solid on defense. Provy's an all around guy at his best. If they're like, oh, we'll give you Puronovich in a second, I'm pretty sure the Flyers aren't going to trade Von Provorov for that. Like, it's going to be more if you get the trade. Expect, I think you will trade him. Sorry, and then you're you're hearing rumors of like Johnny Hockey. You're hearing rumors of Kadri. You don't. Yes, you want uh, those. Forsberg guys. too. Yeah, and yes and no. Like you want the veterans here to kind of mold the younger kids, but then if you're trying to build a younger core, why are you going to bring more veterans on? Yeah, the only way I see us bringing in Johnny's if we get rid of two veteran uh, for, or, or Forsberg. Either one, because it doesn't make sense if you just get rid of JVR to, like you said, stopgap another young guy. But if you get rid of JVR and Lawton, or JVR and Frost, then, yeah, you have two forward spots. Or JVR, Frost, and Lawton, if they're all in the... Like, depending what they decide to do, if they get rid of a few forwards, then that opens up more spots uh, for you. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do. But I agree that you don't want to stop guys' development just because you want to get certain guys that realistically the rest of the team's not going to catch up to their play because you just have guys developing that are good players, but they're not there yet for another year or two. So like, you don't want to go crazy with those guys, but if you had one of them, 
on defense and offense, I think you might be fine, but you don't want to be like, oh, we're adding Johnny Goudreau. We're adding like, – like, if you add both of them, the problem is the Flyers still aren't one of the top. Like, nobody coming into next season, even if they added, say, Philly Forsberg and Johnny Goudreau, which would be a great thing to do. But I don't think anyone's sitting here still going, oh, the Flyers are one of the top contending teams heading into the 2022-23 because that's not going to just – make them that they need to have more defensive structure and they need to have the defense develop still to be able to help out the goaltending a heck of a lot more than it did this year. And Forsberg's great on both ends. Johnny Goudreau's been better defensively with Sutter, but like, it's not like those two are going to fix that necessarily. So like, I completely agree with you on that front. You can't go crazy um, with the free agents, but if we got one of them, I, I, I would not, uh, shy away from it, but we also don't need to mean necessarily another veteran. I don't know. What's your opinion on this? Because me on defense, I don't even think we necessarily need to, unless if it's a third line veteran defenseman, maybe to, to mix in like a Gabranson type or something like that. Or like a, if Jake, well, Jake McKay's more of a second line defenseman. But if like somebody like that is a door off, so a free agent just to have as your mix in seventh guy, maybe you do that. But we have Ellis coming back up now, which is a godsend to see. Risto's a veteran. You already have two veteran righties in your defense. Yeah, Sam you at this point's twenty six. You don't need you, it. You don't. You don't need any more veteran defensemen. You need a younger core for your defensemen. You also need a younger core for your forwards. Like keep some of your vets because you need them, but also build your younger core. Yeah, and this is a bigger thing because obviously I know we both love him from his Phantoms days. Don't you think the Flyers have? done a weird job lineup wise with Oscar Lindblom this year because see when he's been up in the lineup you started seeing him like click again and get the points going and then all of a sudden he'd be back on the fourth line with Brown and McEwen and no offense to those two guys they're high effort guys and I love Zach McEwen and think that, and we'll get to that in a second about resigning him and think they should resign him but like he they're not anybody that are going to get you help you get points so like when you moved him up though he started producing more I understand you're trying to get JBR to the biggest goal share, which I think he finished with 23. So he's, it, it, it can at least hopefully heighten his trade value. It, it at least doesn't hurt it. But I thought it was odd how they played Limblum this year where they kind of did not help his development at all because they kept putting him up, down, up, down yeah. when they would keep other guys up. Yeah, no, they, they definitely toyed with his emotions. This year. It's, you see it and then you don't see it at the same time. Like... It just it was a weird year for us. Um, and everyone's like, oh, they're tanking, they're tanking. You can't tank if you're a bad team. Yeah, they just didn't have it this year. This was just the year Cam Atkinson hit it on the head. They just literally they just didn't have it this year. It was just a bad season similar to the 07 season that was not very good at all. Um it was a bad overall season. There was luckily though, we did have ending positive. We had Noah Cage come in. We had Igor Zamula come in. We had Ronnie Adder come in. Cam York, before getting injured, played a very solid 30 games. Uh, Sanheim was the best season ever. So we had pos- Bobby Brink came in and played fine. So we had positives moving in the right direction. But that, but in the, but it is hard to see that for a lot of people. Where I, I always like trying to focus on that stuff too, with the fact that the season was a crap storm. Because it was, but then in the end, similar to kind of what I said about the Phantoms, at least it ended with more high effort games again because you got the infusion of this young energy. So everybody else then started picking it up more. And then I and then also you saw in the Blackhawks game, they didn't win that game, but also Lankinen just decided to turn to a brick wall with a couple of those saves when they actually did have chances. Um, and, and same kind of one with Forsberg in the Ottawa game, where they battled enough and you saw that they saw Taze, and Russ said this too, and I completely agree with him, Taze and Kane stepped their game up as veterans, so then you saw Hayes step his game up as a veteran. And the, so it was nice to see guys kind of go, oh, they're stepping up, I got to step it up. Konechny also did the same thing, and he's not even a full-blown veteran. He's 25, he's been in the league for a while, but he's still a younger guy, he's still even in his mid-20s. And those guys stepped up their play. So I liked how the energy because for a while there was a lot of a malaise like February into March where there was games that you would see the effort more, but there was just kind of this malaise over the team 
where it was nice to see when the young guys come in, kind of like throw fuel to the, they kind of threw fuel to the fire again and gave the max effort at least in every game, even when they lost. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it should be definitely an interesting offseason to see what the, the Flyers do to aggressively retool. Yeah, yeah, which is what they say, which will be interesting to see how aggressively they're able to do that. But I did I did really like, because Tippett, I always thought was a good player in the AHL. It's just I didn't think, because he was the main cog we got in the Drew trade, I didn't necessarily think he was going to impress me this much and be able to, like, like, I thought I would like him and be, like, saying I like him, but I didn't think I would be saying, oh, this is one of my favorite guys to watch going in the next season because I'm a Drew, not lover, adorer. Like, he's the guy that I attach myself to the most in hockey that uh, it was hard to see him go. So, like, I thought it would take me longer if we didn't get more than one guy to kind of just be completely in that one guy's favor. But Owen Tippett's definitely earned it with his play. He just needs to, like you said in the Thanos pockets, once he finishes – He's golden. Yeah. But a guy we have to, and I know Flyers Faceful's answer on this is yes for 90% of them, but a guy that we have to talk about keeping around or seeing what they're doing. He's an RFA, so the Flyers have the control. The guy we claimed off of waivers in Zach McEwen. Um, with the way he defends the team, uh, Atkinson talked about not having a lot of guys like that. I feel like even if he's not starting every game, which Russ makes a point, and he only played 73 this year, like McEwen's probably not a guy when you have a full filled out lineup that's playing all 82 games. But he's a guy that when you have him in, he's perfect because he defends the team and he's a guy that's going to, you're not messing with anybody on the ice when McEwen's on the ice. So what's your take on Zach McEwen and keep or uh, trade him as an RFA, I guess would be the other option because you can't you don't usually just let RFAs go. If you don't resign them, you're going to make a lot of people bad, <laughs> um, including me. I became a, bat, a, a fan of Zach McHugh, and I didn't know who he was before the season started, and we signed him, and he brought it this year. He stands up for his teammates, and yeah, I thought he was a great addition. Yeah, no, I thought, I agree. I thought McHugh was a fantastic addition, and when you have that guy that does stick up for your teammates, where we have to have more, obviously, if Hayden Hodgson makes the team, he's another guy that does that. Uh, but you have to have more of those guys mixed in, just like Cam was saying. So he, he to me, especially because one of the leaders of your team in Cam Atkinson said that quote, he said needs to even be, I thought before that we should keep him, but that just adds a different thing to when you have a leader of your team saying we need more guys like that. You got to keep the main guy that is like that on your team because – we also do have a very pesky star player that's butting into a star in Joel Fairby that also we need to temper a little bit so he can stay healthier and doesn't try to fight the entire team sometimes. Because yeah. also also we need to keep you a little bit healthier, Joel. I love the fact that you're willing to fight an entire team for our team, but it's not the best thing for your health at six feet only in your 160-pound territory. So uh, let's let other guys like Zach McEwen do those things. But... Um, that's also why, which I'll throw this in there. We're not going to get him in a JVR trade, but I know the Flyers had interest in him at the deadline when we had interest in Lawson Kraus. He would be one of the guys that I would have the most interest in in the offseason just because he fits that profile. He's a guy that can get you a good amount of points as a new age, I guess is a way to put it, quote, new age enforcer, because you can't just be an enforcer that fights anymore. You also have to bring another dimension where he's a very good net front scorer and has a good shot and is only 24 years of age. So if you're trying to aggressively retool, I feel like you have to bring in players like that that are just ready to kind of hit the hit their first spark season after having a very good season the year before and kind of run with those guys if you're trying to do the aggressive retool. Where thinking of the McEwens and Hodgsons of the world, that made me immediately think of him because he's a amped up offensive version of both of those at the NHL level already that uh, I would think he might be one of my main guys that I would love to see. And I think Briere, honestly, as a guy, would probably have their, his eyes on somebody like him. Fletcher, I'm not so sure from his past track record where he might try to go too much for the guys that we already have too much of. But I feel like Briere definitely could have a his eyes on somebody like that to make the team a little bit more well-rounded. No, I agree. 
Uh, but I think uh, we did have a pretty good, as you did with the Phantoms, wrap up here on the overall players. Now we have to touch on, in this season, before we go, the goaltending, which is going to include one of our favorite young guys in Felix Sandstrom and Carter Hart. And then we also had Martin Jones in there in net this year as well. Uh, Carter Hart, to me, his stats, it's similar to kind of what well, what we talked about with Sandy in the NHL. Stats don't say his play. Because his play, he was putting it all out there on the line for the team. The problem is we did not have, it kind of travels through the organization, unless it was the Reading Royals, the best net front defense in terms of communication. So that's not going to help out your goaltender when you look at the high percentage scoring chances of the other team, and they're in the double digits a lot of times. And you're like, okay, that's not good. So like when it that's obviously a big part of why I think Hart stats were 316, 905. But overall, I didn't think he played a bad season at all, and he's still only 23 years of age. No, he didn't play a bad season at all. And he, he I've always said this, you are only as good as the team in front of you. Those five guys in front of your goaltender have to be doing their job in order for you to do your job. Yeah, and that's the biggest key with the defense, and um, part of it was also just an ever-revolving door of different defensemen, so that doesn't help either, similar to what it was with the Phantoms, but um, you you have to be able to find some similarity and kind of camaraderie between your goaltender, and you can't do that if you have this ridiculous revolving door. So uh, this year, the fact that the guys didn't play the best, unless if your name's Travis Sanheim, and when the young guys came in and performed in front of them, uh, that compounded with the, that fact. I, I, I think he honestly had a fine season. I also don't think Jones did bad as a backup. I just don't think we should keep Morton Jones because Sandstrom's ready to be. Like me not saying we should keep Morton Jones isn't because I think Jones played bad. It's because I think Jones played good enough to go somewhere else and get paid more than we would want to pay him in the first place. And we shouldn't pay Morton Jones $2.5 million because we have a young goaltender that's ready, so what are we wasting $2.5 million on Martin Jones for? So that that's more the only reason I look at that. Me, I think he's going to continue to be successful elsewhere. It's just we don't need him. That's the only reason why no, we, I, I would give it. We don't need him. Um, I think we're going to try and find a way to sign Fedotov, and if we don't, Sandy is more than capable and more than ready. Yeah, and also Fedotov, there is something to be said. He's a very good... Um, like A minus B plus tier Russian goaltender, which we've seen guys like that, like a check off in uh in um obviously Carolina compared to the Sisterkins who had like the upper tier and Sorokins be very successful. But it will be interesting to see if he does get because they might pitch it to him like you still gotta adjust to North America and the different style of ice. We know the KHL has been adjusting their arenas to be more uh to the more NHL style because they're the closest in ranking leagues, but we still need you to adjust. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets at least a cup of coffee in the AHL just to adjust to North American hockey, or he might get that anyway, because if he comes over and struggles, they're probably just going to flop him with Sandy and then have Fedotov try to get going with the Phantoms and then have Sandy be up. So it's, it, that'll be interesting to see in general, because it's not like North American hockey is the same exact thing as playing in Europe because they have the bigger ice. The KHL has some ice that's the same as the NHL now, but not every arena. So they're still more uh, used to that bigger arena with the different angles. So it'll be interesting. Like, I, I think Fedotov is going to be a really good goalie if he comes over, but it'll be interesting to see if they throw the gauntlet right at him as the backup or if they try to let him adjust to North American hockey with at least like 10 to 15, 20 games. With the Phantom. Yeah, I agree. But, and we already touched on, Kuro didn't play up in the NHL this year, but we touched on him having to be healthy for the minor league team and Ursan having to be healthy for the minor league team and also those guys having to be healthy so Sandstrom has the opportunity to even play with the Flyers. Uh, otherwise, they're going to have to, by default, probably continue to let him play with the Phantoms if other goaltenders aren't healthy. So the Phantoms have the best bet. But, I would say our goaltending wasn't the problem this year at all. And I know wow. the broadcast has even talked about that, whether it's Timmy and Coatsy or whether it's JJ and Jonesy or JJ and Hartsey, they all kind of echo that. Like just because their numbers might not look sexy doesn't mean that they were the problem. It means the team in front of them, as you said, wasn't the greatest. Yeah. Uh, I always say that the team in front of you has to do their job in order for the goaltender to do theirs. 
Yeah, and um, that's why I think the goaltending was fine. The defense, to me, as we wrap up this podcast uh, with the final keys, and I'll let you give what your final keys are heading the next season, playing more structurally sound defense that you're very communicative with each other that I saw a little bit more because you had young guys that are just naturally communicative because they're just entering the league. So they're trying to get each other, everybody to see who they are and learn their ways. Uh, you need to be able to communicate more so you don't have the laps in front of the net. Cause it's not an effort thing. I don't think it's just a not miscommute. There's just too many miscues and having a better defensive structure is obviously going to help with that. And that's not just for the defenseman. That's from the forward court down that the Flyers defensive structure as a whole just didn't really come to fruition that that's why we said my other key would be finding the right head coach because I don't think it's Mike Yo at all where Lappy we talked about being the right head coach because he showed good strides. Yo's a veteran and didn't talk the talk and walk the walk, which we said Lappy did. So you can't there's no excuse for that, in my opinion. So I think Yo is a good guy that seems to know what to say to players, but that's more of the marks of an assistant coach than a marks of a head coach that he should just go on and be an assistant somewhere else. And I have success with that because I definitely don't think uh, he's the best head coach. So my ending keys would be find the right head coach to make these systematic changes on offense and defense, but really have to focus on the defensive side so you can be great defensively to then push the offensive side, because that's first and foremost how you have to play if you want to be the best one of the better teams in the league eventually is push your defense to then start your offense because Kirk McDonald says it perfectly. Everybody hates playing defense. So the best way to play defense is be great at it. So you get the damn puck in the offensive zone to play the thing you like doing for most, for most players, at least. Um, I I guess my closing mark is just be more consistent. Inconsistency hurts a team. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a perfect way to put it too, because the team didn't, was not able to find also, Healthy, obviously. Obviously, a thing we did. We left out. That's, that's a, a whole it, other episode. We yeah, that, that's a healthy. Healthy is something we should probably uh, throw in there as well. But again, uh, please continue to hit that sub button. Really appreciate your guys' love and support this far to help us grow to 250 by the end of June. It's been a joy doing another episode of The Grittiest Take with you where Sam was able to join me. As just like we did with the Phantoms, it's going to be linked at the end of this episode. We gave our season recap and player analysis of certain players. We have some good things moving into the future with certain guys. Overall, I don't expect a great record from the Flyers next year, but I expect good strides from guys that are developing and guys we saw have success coming into the lineup this year. And I still think that's something to look forward to. Uh, So I'm looking forward to that, whereas in retool mode, I'm not going to go in and be naive and expect us to rebound and be fantastic like I think Dave Scott does uh, next year. But I do think we're going to see guys be fantastic in terms of uh, the adders of the world and Kate's and other guys we talked about continue to develop in good success rates. Yeah. But stay safe, everybody. Enjoy the off season. And if you want to still catch some organizational playoff hockey, come out tomorrow night as in Satande arena, the Royals will be trying to clinch their first round playoff series against the main Mariners and local area product, Nick master and former flyers prospect, Pascal LaBerge. Peace out everybody and stay safe.